the mandible, holds the distinction of being one of the first bones to start its journey of formation in the human embryo. The creation of the mandible is a fascinating process that begins with the formation of two separate pieces of cartilage. These are not just any pieces of cartilage, they are Meckel's cartilages. Named after the German anatomist Johann Friedrich Meckel, these structures play a pivotal role in the formation of our mandible. As our embryonic self continues to grow and develop, so do these cartilages, gradually extending and eventually fusing together at what will become the chin. This fusion forms a solid foundation, the precursor to our mandible. But the role of the Meckel's cartilages doesn't stop there. They act as a guide, directing the formation of the bone around them. As the bone continues to grow and solidify, the cartilages eventually disintegrate, leaving behind the newly formed mandible. What we're left with is a unique bone that has the strength and resilience to withstand the rigors of chewing, speaking, and a myriad of other tasks we often take for granted. It's also the only movable bone in our skull, a feature that adds to its uniqueness and importance. So now that we've set the stage with the birth of the mandible, let's journey forward to its growth after birth. From the moment a baby is born, their mandible begins a remarkable journey of growth. This isn't merely a case of the bone getting larger. It's about the mandible evolving to accommodate the eruption of the baby's first teeth and the development of the muscles needed for chewing and speech. The growth of mandible in the first year of life involves growth at the symphyseal suture and lateral expansion in the anterior region to accommodate the erupting anterior teeth. The mental foramen is directed at right angle to the surface of the corpus. There is increased deposition in the posterior surface of the ramus of the mandible. The infant mandible is suited for the suckling activity since the condyle and the glenoid fossa is flat, which helps in the anteroposterior movement of the mandible. Mandible in the adult is different from the mandible of an infant. The ramus is longer, and the gonial angle is less obtuse, the bone is larger on the whole and the condyle is well developed. All these changes take place with the growth of the mandible in the form of an expanding V. It is easier to visualize mandible as the V-shaped bone than the maxilla because of its horseshoe shape. The growth of the mandible in length anteroposteriorly is by the deposition of bone at the posterior surface of the ramus and resorption of the leading edge of the anterior surface. This helps to lengthen mandible so that the anterior part of the ramus is occupied by the posterior part of the body in the future and to accommodate the developing permanent molars. As the mandible grows posteriorly, it is displaced anteriorly because the articulation of the condyle to the glenoid fossa is constant and the change in length can take place only by the anterior displacement. As the mandible grows anteriorly, the opening of the mental foramen faces backwards so that the neurovascular bundle leaves the foramen directed backwards. There is corresponding surface modeling at the anterior border with deposition in the posterior surface of the symphysis and resorption in the superior part of the anterior surface, and deposition in the interior aspect. There is deposition on the lateral surface of the ramus, and resorption on the lingual surface below the mylohyoid ridge. In contrast, the coronoid process, which looks almost like an extension of the ramus in the anterior border, undergoes apposition at the medial surface and resorption at the lateral surface. This expands the mandible like a V. The condyle undergoes reduction of bone on the lateral aspect of neck and deposition corresponding to the V principle, which makes the condyle longer at the neck. Thus, the interimal distance is efficiently increased by the growth of mandible following the V principle. This helps the mandible to keep pace with the growth of the cranial base, the alveolar bone increases the height of the bone by filling the intermaxillary space. The mandible, which is often retrognathic in the newborn, assumes an orthognathic relation with the maxilla during adulthood due to the growth of the bone in length. Contrary to the old belief, it is now found that the condylar cartilage contributes little, if any, to the growth and does not act as primary growth center. In patients with ankylosis of the TMJ, mandible is found to grow to normal length. The muscular processes of the mandible like the angle, coronoid and condylar processes are under the influence of the periosteal matrix. Alveolar process height correlates well with the eruption of teeth. Bone deposition taking place in the lower border of mandible also contributes to increase in height of the mandible. 
The body of the mandible, which forms a basal tubular portion in the form of an arc from the foramen oval through the mandibular to the mental foramen, is the most constant portion of the mandible. This portion of the mandible is, in the form of a logarithmic spiral form, the foramen ovale to mental foramen protecting the mandibular nerve. Bjork used implants to study the growth pattern of mandible. He found that mandible undergoes growth rotation in the form of intramatrix and matrix rotation when the body of the mandible is considered the matrix. It was found that though mandible undergoes rotation, the effects seen are minimal due to external compensation. The mandible may be absent in some cases. This condition is called agnathia. Macrognathia, a condition of prognathic mandible, is seen in hyperpituitarism. Micrognathia is seen in Pierre Robin syndrome, defective mandible is seen in treacher collins syndrome, Down syndrome, etc. The growth of mandible is largely influenced by the functional matrices and condylar cartilage has little influence in its overall growth. Now let's delve into the condylar growth which is the one of the most important aspect in the development of mandible. The condylar cartilage develops from mesenchymal cells unrelated to the first branchial arch. It is therefore referred to as secondary cartilage, since its formation is secondary to the original primordial cartilage. Condylar cartilage formation starts at 8 weeks of intrauterine life when it is separated from the rest of the mandible. Later it fuses with the mandibular ramus at about 16th week of intrauterine life. Initially the condylar cartilage appears as cone or carrot shaped, the large end of the cone assuming the position of future condyle. By 20th week the wedge of cartilage is connected to bone except for a thin layer of articular surface. Condylar cartilage covers the surface of the mandibular condyle at the TMJ. The individual condyle remodels according to the expanding V principle. Condylar cartilage can be visualized as being positioned on the inner aspect of the expanding V. Neck of the condyle is lengthened by the reduction of the bone situated on the side of the V, away from the direction of the growth mandible exists within a functional matrix. Growth of mandible is entirely secondary. Mandible exists within a capsule formed by the soft tissues of the face. Therefore expansion of the functionally related tissues is the primary event in condylar growth. Proliferative and subsequent endochondral ossifications of the condylar cartilage are secondary compensatory mechanisms. Growth of the facial viscera translates the entire mandible in space. Condylar growth takes place in postero-superior direction in order to preserve the functionally important TMJ.